Good morning. Do you know it's something we all like? Something that we love? We really like to win. We love winning. I may or may not have made my eight-year-old cry one time because I like winning so much. That's a true story. Some of you, your day yesterday, the joy or the tragedy of your day depended on the performance of a football team that you have no control over whatsoever. Your happiness rested on the performance of 18 to 22 year old men. (laughs) Because we love winning. And today, your happiness will rest yet again. Maybe. Maybe you've become desensitized at this point. I understand. Try being a baseball fan where your happiness and joy 162 times in a season is dependent on how these people perform. We love winning. We do. It's like a drug. In fact, some people love winning so much, and this is, this, they've done studies, that when the election comes next month, they will not vote for the candidate that they want to win. They will vote for the one that they think will win so that they can say, I was right. They can say, my guy, my gal won. We won. We won. That's how addictive it is to say that I won. You will burn down relationships. You will burn bridges with family members. You will say terrible things to people you work with, people you live with, so that you can win. You'll be in an argument with somebody and you will have something in the back of your brain that will say, do not say that thing. It will wreck that person. And you'll have this other person who's like, say it. It will wreck them. Because we want to win. Now, what if I told you that I knew a way for you to be undefeated? What would you give to never lose again? What would you sacrifice to never have to taste that bitter, chalky, nasty taste of defeat? Well, today I'm going to talk to you about how we can become undefeated, how we overcome. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. You saw that we're still in this sermon series called The Good Life, looking at the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And today we are going to overcome. We will overcome by challenging, by cherishing, and by changing. Challenging, cherishing, and changing. First, we need to challenge. We need to challenge our enemies. We overcome by challenging our enemies. Look at verse 43. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus is the last time that Jesus is going to do this in this sermon where he takes a commandment and he elevates it, or he does something different. He puts a twist on it. And this one is a little odd. Because he says, you have heard it said, love your enemy, or sorry, love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. Now, where would they have heard this from? Every time we've looked at these so far, there's been a law, or there's been a commandment in the Old Testament that, has, that Jesus is working with. But here it's a little different. The first part, love your neighbor, is in the Old Testament. It's in the Old Covenant. Right smack dab in Leviticus 19.18. The middle of Leviticus, that hateful old mean book that's so boring that everybody's like, oh my gosh, every time I've tried to read the Bible, Leviticus rises up out of the ashes and destroys my willpower. Right there in the middle, Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor. And so Jesus is reading this, and he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor. But then there's this other part, hate your enemy. Now, where did that come from? That's not actually in the Torah. It's not in the Old Testament. In fact, you really can't find a place in Scripture where God's like, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hate your enemies. So where did this come from? This was an extrapolation, perhaps, of the love your neighbor commandment. Because when you get to the love your neighbor, you're like, well, who is that? Who is my neighbor? That's a fine question. Who's my neighbor? And the Israelites probably looked around as a country, as a kingdom, and they thought to themselves, well, let's look around and see who our neighbors are. We got Egypt, 
They super hate us. There's 10 reasons why. There's the Assyrians. No, nah, they super want to haul us into slavery. The Babylonians have similar designs on us. What about the Syrians? Now nah, they're right up there and they will ally with anybody that wants to destroy us. What about the Philistines? Nope, not the Philistines. Nope, don't like us. Amorites, Midianites, Edomites, websites, they all hate us. Everybody hates us. So when you look around and you realize that everybody except your own people hates you, you adopt this idea that my neighbor is just, just the people who are related to me, just the people who are my countrymen. That's my neighbor. Anybody outside of that? Nope. So it comes this sort of Israel versus the world approach. And so they develop this idea where they're going to hate their enemy. Now, you may hear this today and you think, well, Travis, I don't have any enemies. There's no one trying to kill me. If there is someone trying to kill you today, please come talk to me about that. I understand that thou now makes me vulnerable and at risk, but that sounds kind of exciting. So let's take a, let's take a journey together. But no, probably don't have enemies like that. I mean, there are probably people or groups of people, we know this in the world, that don't like Americans or maybe don't like where we live and, and have idealistic differences. And like, given the opportunity, they, they could do harm to us, not because of anything personal, but just because of where we're from or, or the language we speak or the place we have in society. I get that. But like personal enemies, we don't really think about that. What, so what we need to do is we need to think about enemies differently. And we live in an incredibly narratively driven society. And what that means is we take in a lot of stories. We watch a lot of TV. We watch a lot of movies. Even our sports are narratively driven, right? You have the underdog and you have the, the Goliath, the David and Goliath. That's narratively driven. An upset is all narratively driven. And when you read and watch a lot of narrative things you begin to identify with who? The protagonist. You're supposed to. You're supposed to see the main character and you're supposed to say, that person and me are just alike. If you don't identify with the protagonist, do you know what you do? You usually turn off the show. You usually close the book. You're like, I don't, I don't, this isn't for me. And so we've been designed, we've been, not designed, we've been groomed to identify with a protagonist and a protagonist in every story has what? Antagonists. And so an antagonist is anybody that gets in the way of the goals of the protagonist. Anybody that gets in the way of what the protagonist wants to do, that's an antagonist. And they may be a good person or a bad person. You can have an antagonist that's a very good person, but they're against the protagonist. And so we view ourselves as the main character of our story. And because we're the main character of the story, anybody that gets in our way of doing what we want to do becomes the antagonist, i.e. our enemy. You want to get out the door? Get to church quickly, and your kid won't put on your shoe, her shoes? Antagonist. You've become my mortal enemy. And usually your toddler's like, I'm cool with that. Let's do that. I'm into this. You and your spouse want to do something different in the house. That didn't mean to rhyme, but it did. And you decide, one, one of you wants to paint something one color and another color, antagonist. We're fighting. Somebody at your job. They're a very nice person. They go to a different church, but they're very kind, compassionate. But you guys have a different vision for this project. They're in the way. Because if you can get your thing done, maybe you'll get a promotion. You'll get a bonus. You'll get a raise. Antagonist. Enemy. You're in my way. The person that cuts you off doesn't use a blinker. What's it there for? I'm not going to use it. Antagonist. And so this leads us to an interesting question. We're surrounded on all sides, much like the Israelites felt. We're surrounded. In any moment, the people closest to you could become antagonists. And you could become theirs. Life can quickly turn into like a WWE cage match. And so, Travis, are you saying, because many of you probably have read ahead here, 
Are you saying that when Jesus tells me in a minute to love my enemy, am I just supposed to let all these antagonists walk all over me? I'm just supposed to be a doormat. That's a typical question you get asked in this passage. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. I think Jesus is telling us to challenge our enemies because that's what he does. To challenge our enemies. Why? That's how Jesus functions. When Jesus is about to be arrested, when he's about to be arrested at the end of John, the people show up to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane and they're like, we're here to arrest Jesus. And he says, I am he. And when he says, I am he, they all fall over. And they get back up and they do it again and he falls back over and then he voluntarily goes with them. This is to show you that at any point, Jesus could have just obliterated his enemies. He could have been like, we're done. We're out. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't have to put up with this. At any point, Jesus can overpower and overwhelm his enemies. But that's not what he does. At the same time, Jesus doesn't just roll over for his enemies either. How many times is Jesus like a thorn in the side of the people who can't stand him? I think Jesus took a certain amount of pleasure in aggravating people. Every time I feel convicted, I'm like, Jesus, really now? Jesus was incredibly provocative. He turned over tables. I think he intentionally healed people on the Sabbath just to irritate the Pharisees. I think he's like, I could heal him on, on Friday, but I'm going to wait until the sun goes down. Just give it a minute. Why, Jesus? Well, because just watch that guy over there blow his top. <laughs> Jesus is provocative. So he doesn't just roll over, but he also is the strongest man on the planet. With a word, people fall over. He advocates for this middle path of challenging your enemies. Challenging your enemies. Not so you can overwhelm them. You don't want to defeat them in that way. You don't want them to be powerless. You don't want to be destroyed. You don't want to be so, so bombed out and war-torn. Your, pers the person, uh, the, your antagonist is a shell of themselves because of the way you eviscerated them with your words or with your plans or with your plots. But he doesn't want you to feel that way either. So there's this middle ground of challenging them. You're seeking to change them. And not so you can convert them to your way of seeing things. No, 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 no. It's so you can convert them to God's way of seeing things, which may or may not be the way you see things. See, what's different about the way that Jesus challenges his enemies and the way we challenge our antagonists is that Jesus actually loves his antagonists. We don't. The moment that antagonist rises up against me, it can be my own wife, who I have committed to love for the rest of my life. It can be my children, who I would do anything for. But in that moment, there is no feeling of love. There is no mercy. There is only get your shoes on, or I will rain down such unheavenly fire upon you. You have to challenge with a heart towards love for what's best for them. We refuse to let our heart be broken by our enemies. Because usually when we're challenged, Jesus' heart broke because they didn't see the world the way that he saw it. They didn't see the destructive path that their life was taking. And so Jesus' heart broke. But when our enemies do something to antagonize us, you know what we do? It steals our heart. We have greater resolve. We're like, I'm going to resist you. We meet strength with strength. You cannot actually challenge your enemy if you cannot love them. Because the purpose is for them to grow, to mature, to change. And that's God's purpose for you as well in the midst of that conflict. This is, what, this is how you change the game. You want to be undefeated, you have to change the scorecard. You've got to start playing chess instead of checkers. And while they're trying to, to win an argument or they're trying to get a good business deal or they're trying to do whatever, you're trying to do something else entirely. You're trying to show them the great love and grace of Christ in challenging them with a different way. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, uh, in, in I think it's Matthew 18, when uh, you're in conflict with your brother or sister, 
You go to them, you confront them. And if they don't listen to you, then you bring someone else. And if they still don't listen to you, you bring the church. And then at the end of that passage, it says, and if they listen to you, good, you have won your brother. Good, you have won. You've won. And Jesus tells us what the scorecard is. Gaining your, the person you're in, and if, reconciling with that, the antagonist. That is the win. And if reconciliation doesn't happen, then there's still something to move towards. So what does it take to do this? Well, in Luke 6.42, Jesus says to take the log out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck out of someone else's. And what we've done with this traditionally is we've looked at this as a, my sin is worse than your sin. What right do I have to say anything about your eye? That's not what's going on. Okay, this is all a matter of perspective. I want everybody to take your finger. The first hour was super uncomfortable with the idea of taking their finger and doing anything with it. Pick your finger up and hold it up like this. You ever played this little light of mine? Yeah, we're gonna do this now, just kidding. Take your finger and put it as close as possible to your eyeball. Don't touch it, don't be weird, don't gross anybody out, just. Is it obscuring your vision in any way? Yes. If not, you have some sort of weird superpower. You can put your finger down now. So when you have something very small in your eye, because of perspective, it looks very, very large. And it obscures your vision. Just because something looks small in your eye, to you it will look very large. So this log that's in your eye is actually a speck. We have equal sin. We're all sinners. We're all broken but I have this thing in my eye that looks big to me. You have this thing in your eye that looks big to you. And so how do I challenge each other? The first is you need to recognize that that thing in the other person's eye looks like a log to them and they have a blind spot. And typically when you see somebody who can't see, I don't know if we have anybody that that has uh, a vision disability here or watching online. One of the things that rises up inside of, well, two of the things, one is admiration, right? You've ever seen somebody who's, who's blind and they're, they're, they're shopping, they're doing all sorts of things, and you're like, oh my God, I don't know how I would function. And I understand you learn how to do that. But living in a world without your sight is so challenging. I, I have the utmost respect for people that do that. And at the same time, Especially for people in this day and age, there wasn't Braille. There, wasn't, there weren't programs for people to learn how to function as a blind person. So if you were blind, basically the only thing you could do was beg. And so a great deal of sympathy would go out to people who were blind. When you see that someone in your life has a blind spot, there's literally something in their life they can't see it. You should feel bad for them. You shouldn't have this feeling to your, towards your antagonist where you're like, yeah, well, this loser doesn't know what he's doing because of this, this, and this. That idiot can't do this, that, and the other. We should feel sympathy. Your heart should break for them. We're so afraid to let our heart break for our enemies because we're afraid they'll use it against us. So that's the first thing you need to do. Feel sympathy, empathy for your enemy. Second thing is to recognize that you also have something in your eye. And this leads to humility. Recognize that there are problems in your own life. So when you go to challenge somebody about the thing in their life, the thing that you know is destructive in their life, you also have to recognize, hey, I'm not any better off than you are. I know I've got this thing. So usually what happens when you challenge an enemy, they're like, well, who are you to talk? You've got this thing in your life. You're absolutely right, I do. And I would love to hear what you have to think about that at some point but we're not talking about me right now. We're talking about you. And can we have that conversation? The last thing is, I don't know about you. I'm sure in this room we have at least one. But I am not qualified to do eye surgery. At all. Just the other day, my wife had something in her eye. Kim had something in her eye. And she was like, can you help me look for it? I was like, yeah. I was trying to coach her. I was like, rinse it out with this, do this, that, and the other. But what I did not do was like take some tweezers and be like, hang on one second. You know why I didn't do that? Because I think my wife's eyes are beautiful and I'd like for her to continue to have two. Although I think eye patches are super cool. Every time she walked into a room, I'd be like, are you okay? I didn't do that. 
I'm not qualified to do that. There will be people in your life that you're able to identify generally the sin that they have, the struggle that they have, the speck in their eye. You might be able to say they're arrogant. They swell with pride. They're greedy. They're immature. That's not hard. In the same way, it's not hard for me to be like, yeah, you do have something your eye can tell because of how bloodshot your eye is. But what you can't do is be like, I know exactly how you need to be humbled, and I'm going to help God out with that. I know exactly you need to stop being so greedy, and I'm going to punish you. You don't get that right. You are not the eye surgeon. So you have to depend upon the Lord. Now, the Lord may use you in some way to confront them, but you can't go to them and be like, let me give you my six-step plan for you so that you can stop being such a jerk. If you're going to challenge them, you can't be the one that knows it all. Okay? So we have to challenge our enemies. We also have to cherish our enemies. We have to love them well. Verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Jesus, once again, elevates this command from loving your neighbors to also loving your enemies. Now, it's important to recognize this is not just a feeling. About half of you are singing Boston in your head right now. It is more than a feeling, right? You've got more than a feeling. If you wait to feel something for your enemy, you will never love them. It's also an action, You can't say, oh yeah, I love my enemies. The absence of ill will towards someone is not love, okay? Just because you can't sit here and think of somebody that antagonizes you, one, I don't think you're trying hard enough. But two, the absence of ill will does not mean that you love people. It doesn't. Action, tangible effort is a way that you evidence love to other people. And Jesus gives us practical ways to do this. He gives us two. Now, before we get into these two, I want to say two things about it. One, this is an excellent diagnostic. If you are doing these two things, you have a good idea that I am on the road to loving my enemies. If you're not doing these two things, you cannot say you love your enemies, okay? It's a good diagnostic. The second thing, this is not an exhaustive list. If you do these two things, you, can't, you don't get to say, well, I'll stop. I clearly am loving my enemies. I'm doing the two things Jesus said. I'm done. That's not, it's not exhaustive. Okay, so what does he say? The first thing he says is in verse 44. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So he calls us to pray for our antagonists. Pray for the people that rise up against us. Okay? Now, this is not... God, I really wish that they would realize how smart I am and how dumb they are. God, I'm sorry that you have made such a moron. But clearly, I am greater. And I wish that you would impart to them some divine revelation so that they can see both my greatness and yours because you clearly made all of this. That is not praying for your enemies, okay? That's, no, I don't even know that that's prayer. And it's just some deranged babbling. Praying for your enemies is praying blessing on their life. It is praying that they would know the grace of God. That they would experience closeness to the Savior. It is praying that God would bless their family. It is praying that God would give them success would grant them joy and satisfaction, would give their life meaning and purpose. Sure, it can be praying for conviction in their life, absolutely. But so that they might draw closer to the Lord, not so that they could see things your way. God is calling us to pray for our enemies here the same way you would pray for your closest, dearest loved one. That's how we're called to pray for them, to pray for your antagonists in that way. And what I love about this command 
is that Jesus removes any opportunity we have for an excuse. So often with things like this, when we involve antagonists or enemies, people start asking questions like, well, well, where does this stop? Like, do I have to pray for my abuser? Do I have to pray for terrorists? Do I have to pray for so-and-so? Like, where, where does this stop? And the great thing about this is there is no limit. There is no out. Because notice what Jesus says in the passage. He says, pray, love your enemies and pray for those who do what? Persecute you. Now, Jesus says this during a time when there's not any persecution of Christians. Why? Because there aren't any Christians. Jesus hasn't died yet. But it's written by Matthew during a time to the church when the church is being persecuted by an emperor named Nero. And what did Nero like to do to Christians? Well, he liked to do a lot of things. He would crucify them. He would uh, take them into the arena and he would let them be eaten by wild animals. He would also, and this is the most heinous thing, he would take Christians, he would bind them and put them on large poles and he would cover them in pitch and he would light them on fire. And that's how he would light his garden at night. And he would host parties where screaming Christians were the lamps for the evening. And Matthew, well, Jesus, through Matthew's words, is telling people that's the person you pray for. That's the upper limit of the person you pray for. Now, I know some of you in the room might be like, well, Travis, like, that doesn't seem healthy. If you are in counseling because of an abusive relationship that you have been in, I would encourage you to take this text to your counselor. Most good counselors will say, what are some goals that you have? What are some things you want to accomplish? Take this to your counselor and say, I want to get to the point where I can pray for my abuser. I can pray for the people who hurt me. That doesn't mean you build a relationship with them. That doesn't mean you, you become best friends. That's not what I'm saying at all. You can pray from long range. And you can pray for them. And I understand it takes work to get there. But that is a sign that you love your enemy. Secondly, Jesus says that we should love our enemies so that we will be sons of our Father in heaven, like sons of our Father in heaven. R.T. France calls this the strongest ethical card that Jesus has. Now, how do we do this? What does this look like? Well, it's embedded in the purpose statement. Notice it says, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Well, what do we know? We know that Jesus is the only Son of God. So what God is saying here, what Jesus is saying, is that through loving our enemies, we will be like him. And if we want to know how to love our enemies, we should look at him. Well, how does Jesus love his enemies? What does he do for us? We're all his antagonists. When we sin, we take on the role of antagonist to God. And what does he do for us? Does he just wipe us out? Does he just obliterate us? Does he stomp us? Does he let us just do what we want and we run all over him? No. He lays down his life for us. He sacrifices himself. Self-sacrifice is the way in which love is done across the board, including your enemies. You see it in John 15, 13. You see it in 1 John 3, 16. In both of those, Jesus or John, I guess it's John both times, one through Jesus and the other one through someone else. Both are the author of John. And he says, somebody shows the greatest love when they lay down their life for other people. Now, if you're, you're aware of those texts, you know that in neither place is the writer talking about enemies. Because in the first one, he says friends. In the second one, you're laying down your life for the brothers in the church, brothers and sisters. So you say, Travis, this is not really about enemies. And that's where we show our hypocrisy. That's where we show our hypocrisy. Because remember when Jesus uh, has a scribe come to him? We talked about this a little bit earlier. And he says, hey, what are the most important commandments? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then in one of the stories, one of the tellings of this, the man says, it says, seeking to justify himself, he asks, who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. There's a Jewish man going to Jerusalem. He gets beat up, gets nearly left for dead. All of his stuff is taken. And all these other Jewish people pass him by, except for the Samaritan, his mortal enemy. Samaritans hate Jews. Jews hate Samaritans. And the Samaritan sacrifices his time, sacrifices his treasure, sacrifices his life nearly, because those robbers may come back. 
to rescue this man who's his enemy. When we ask the question, well, who exactly am I supposed to love? You're asking the same question the scribe asked. And Jesus says, there is no limit to the people that we sacrifice for. We have to value our enemies. It's incredibly important that we value our enemies, that we love them well. We have to cherish them. You've got to humanize them. Even when their behavior turns them into a monster, you have to humanize them. You've got to find ways. Because when we're mad at somebody, when somebody's an antagonist, we dehumanize people so that we can fight against them. That's like the foundation of, of colonialism. It's the reason why racism and colonialism go hand in hand. It's really hard to extort people that you think are your equal. And it's really easy to take advantage of somebody if you view them as less than you. You've got to find ways to humanize your opponent, to find sympathy for them, empathy for them, to love them. And when you give someone back their humanity, even if it's in your own heart, in your own mind, you become like Christ. Because that's what Christ has done for us. He's all about giving us back our humanity, piecing us back together. So we have to cherish our opponents. We've got to challenge them, we've got to cherish them, but we also have to change, but not them. We have to change ourselves. We have to see that ourselves are changed. Verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now this fits and does not fit with the end of this passage. The reason why it doesn't fit is because most commentators think that this is a summary statement of the entire six laws that Jesus has just elevated. It's like a transition sentence in the sermon as Jesus moves on to the next large portion of the sermon, which will start next week. And so this is kind of a wrap up. He, he said, you know, if you're going to be perfect, then you need to do the things I just told you to do. Don't lust, don't murder, don't take false oaths, don't get a divorce, things like that. So Jesus is moving through all those things. Now we read that, be perfect, and we think, we dismiss it. It's like, I know it, I can't really be perfect, so it's like an aspirational thing. Not realizing that what God has done is the word perfect there means whole, to be complete. What Jesus is saying here is if you want to have integrity like our Father, then you, when we sin, when we do the things that he's commanded us not to do, we fracture off pieces of ourselves. We break apart. We shatter ourselves. And we do this to other people as well. And so we have to go back to the Lord again and again and again, seeking repentance, seeking confession, so that he can piece us back together again. This is wholeness. And this wholeness is usually evidenced through love. How do I know this? Well, this is where all eternity is going. What do you think eternity looks like? It's a place of love, of self-sacrificing, unselfish love. There are no antagonists. Why? Why do I know that that's the way that history is going? It's because that's where history started. With a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, loving one another, favoring one another, the Son and the Spirit, submitting themselves to the will of the Father. Why? Because they want to. Because they love Him. And because He loves them. And there's this dance of love going on. Love is core to the person of God, to his character. And so if that's where it started, that has to be where it's going. And I can tell this is hard for us. You know how I know this is hard for us? Because we ask all sorts of questions about this passage. We ask, who's my enemy? Who's my neighbor? What does it mean to be perfect? Explain that, Travis. You know what we don't ask? Nobody ever asks, what does it mean to love somebody? What does it mean to love somebody? You know why we don't ask that question? We think we know what it means. We are so arrogant to think we know what love is because we saw it on a movie or we saw it on a TV show or we, we think it's this feeling that wells up inside of us when we look at our child when it, it's asleep. Or we read it in a Jane Austen novel and we think we know what it is and we don't. Because if our definition of love is anything other than self-sacrifice, we do not know what it is. You have no clue. So what do we need to do today? We're going to do two things today. The first, and we're going to do it in a minute, I want to give you some time to think about 
it is we're going to break up into groups of four or five people. I know this is awkward. I know this is strange for you, and we're going to pray for our enemies. And I, can I, I'll just be honest. I don't, I don't mind. Uh, there were many people in the first service who left before we did this. More than, than usual. And so I'm going to challenge you to stick with this. To have an enemy, to have an antagonist that you're going to pray for today. You don't have to mention them out, na- out, out loud. If it's the person sitting next to you, maybe get a different group. Maybe in your, in, when you're in that other group, mention their name just a little loudly so they hear it. But pray for your enemies. We're going to do that in a few minutes. The second thing I want us to point out is how Christ has treated us as his antagonists. God had a perfect plan designed for this place, this world. And we have taken on the role of antagonist, interrupting, disrupting, challenging his plans for this place again and again and again and again. And he doesn't obliterate us. Instead, he dies for us. He self sacrifices He lays down his life for us. And so you have the chance today to have a relationship with him because the greatest enemy that you will ever face, you know the greatest antagonist of humanity? It's death. Every single one of us is terrified of dying. Every single one of us. You know why I know this? It's because we hold simultaneously in our brain, we are terrified to die some slow, agonizing, painful death when we're really old, but we're also terrified to die a quick death suddenly in a car wreck. You know why we're afraid of both? Because we don't want to die. We think it's going to happen to somebody else. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that Jesus has conquered death, that the last enemy to be defeated is death. If you want to go 1-0 and against death, if you want to go undefeated against death, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the only person who went into the tomb and came back out and stayed out. He is undefeated against death, and he offers that same victory to you. The greatest antagonist you will ever know. And if you've got death whipped, who cares about the other antagonist? Who cares about the other enemies you face? If you've got death beat, who cares? The greatest enemy, the big bad, the one that wants to destroy your life and take everything from you, death itself has been trounced 2,000 years ago. And Jesus says, you want to be on my team? You want to win every time? And we foolishly look at him and we're like, I can handle it. I got this. I run marathons. And he still holds out that hand for you. Just go ahead and get in your groups. Go ahead and turn to the people around you. Three, four, five people. Pray for your your enemies. The band's going to lead us in a time uh, of worship afterwards. And then we'll close.